Where does our energy come from? Of course, from our food, but what actually happens inside us to turn that food into energy? And how can we use that information to make us better athletes? Today, we delve into the science behind our body's fuel sources. The human body uses carbohydrates, fat, and protein to fuel physical activity. We know we need to eat these things to provide energy regardless of the intensity of activity. If you're lying on the couch reading a book or doing an Ironman, these macronutrients are what fuels you. ATP is the body's immediate fuel source, but you don't actually eat it. It needs to be generated in the body all the time, and how it is generated depends on the availability of oxygen and how much carbs, fat, and protein are used. ATP can be produced without oxygen, but not very much and not very efficiently. Within muscle cells, glucose can be broken down into pyruvate and lactic acid, and the process releases ATP, which your muscles can then use to fuel movement. And this can be done without any oxygen. Within your cells, mitochondria can use carbs, fats, and protein in the presence of oxygen to produce ATP. This process is much slower, but much more ATP is produced, and this is how most of your body's energy is produced. Today, we'll look at how the duration of your activity determines the fuel used, and also how the intensity of your activity changes the contribution from different fuel sources. As you know, in order to get oxygen into your body, you breathe it into your lungs. It is then transported by the cardiovascular system using your blood to every muscle in the body where it's used to produce that ATP. When your body is at rest, lying on the couch, your heart and lungs are easily able to meet the demands of the muscles to provide enough oxygen. However, when you start physical activity, your muscles need more energy and therefore more oxygen. And so your heart rate and breathing rate will increase to provide more oxygen to those working muscles. How much they increase and how much more oxygen your muscles need depends on the duration and intensity of exercise and, of course, the physical conditioning of that athlete. So how does duration affect the fuel source? During the first few steps of exercise, your muscles respond immediately to the change in activity level. Your heart and lungs are much slower to respond and so can't change the amount of oxygen available. And so, to meet your body's immediate energy needs, your body uses that small amount of ATP that's stored in muscles for those first few seconds. But that doesn't last very long. Your body can squeeze a few more seconds of energy out by using a substance called creatine phosphate to convert adenosine diphosphate into ATP, but after about 10 seconds, the creatine phosphate is also depleted. So after about 15 seconds, all of the ATP and creatine phosphate in your muscles is depleted. But your heart and lungs still haven't started working harder, and so your muscles need to produce more ATP without the use of oxygen, anaerobically. Your muscles can produce ATP really fast using glucose which is obtained from stored muscle glycogen. After about 30 seconds, this system is in full swing, but your muscles can't store very much glycogen, so it can't continue for very long. After about two to three minutes of exercise, your heart rate and breathing rate have increased sufficiently to provide enough oxygen to the working muscles, and aerobic production of ATP kicks in. This is by far the most efficient way to produce ATP, with much more ATP produced from each molecule of glucose. The primary fuel source for aerobic production of ATP is carbohydrates, but fatty acids and proteins can also be used to produce the needed ATP. Which fuel source is used, carbohydrates, fats or protein, will depend on the duration of exercise and also how many nutrients are available and how fast they are needed. Glucose or carbohydrates may come from blood glucose, from eating carbs or from liver glycogen or glucose synthesis, or from muscle glycogen as we've already mentioned. Glucose is your primary fuel source for all energy production, whether it's aerobic or anaerobic. Small amounts of fat are stored in your muscles as triglycerides, but 90% of the fats are stored in your body as adipose tissue. That's those fatty deposits you see on your tummy or your butt or wherever. As low to moderate intensity exercise continues for long periods, fatty acids become the primary fuel source for working muscles. Protein is not really considered a primary fuel source, although small amounts of amino acids are used to produce energy. This amount increases as your daily nutrient needs are not met, i.e. you are starving, or your exercise duration goes to the extremes. Exercise intensity determines the contribution of different fuel sources for your ATP production. During low intensity activities, your body will primarily use aerobic metabolism to produce the needed ATP because it's far more efficient and produces more ATP, with fat being the primary fuel source. And because the body's stores of fat are almost unlimited, 
low intensity activity can continue for a very long time. As your exercise intensity increases, the rate that is needed begins to exceed the slow rate that it can be reduced from the fat. And so your body to glucose and eventually even aerobic metabolism to meet the increasing demands of the working muscles. While all fuel sources combine all the time to meet the demands, glucose differs from fat in that your glucose stores are limited and you will eventually run out. You will literally run out of energy. This doesn't mean you have to stop. It just means that from then on, you will only be able to continue at the rate at which your body can produce energy from the fat stores. This point is usually reached one to two hours into exercise, although it can be improved with training. As you can imagine, the point where you go from 10, 20, even 30% of your energy coming from glycogen to all of your energy coming from fat can feel like quite a dip. And it's important to know where this is and what is happening in endurance sport so that you don't just feel like, that's it, I'm done, and throw in the towel. One final point about exercise intensity and fuel sources, the so-called fat burning zone. It's true that below 70% heart rate, your body mostly uses fat as a fuel source. And in fact, there's a fat max point, an intensity at which your body is burning the most fat it can. And if you go any harder, the amount of fat you burn actually decreases. But that's not the whole story. Obviously, the higher intensity exercise actually burns more total calories, even if a lower percentage of that is coming from fat. And higher intensity exercise means a longer recovery period a longer time at which your basal metabolic rate is higher than it was before exercise. And during this period, you're mostly burning fat. So if you're trying to lose weight and get into a negative caloric balance, higher intensity exercise may actually have a better effect at your fat burning than lower intensity exercise. Having said that, don't go out and go as hard as you can all the time. Make sure that your exercise is safe and at an intensity that you can handle. We hope this video has given you some insight into what's going on inside your body while you're doing endurance activity and your knowledge on fuel sources can help you better prepare for your next triathlon. If you've enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to GTN for more triathlon related content.